Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here today, as well as um, thank SK Planet for inviting me to speak. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the translator who will be helping me communicate with you today and hopefully making me sound smart and articulate. So thank you. Um, so I work at Etsy, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what Etsy is, but I'll first say that um, I've been there for three years, um, and in that time we've just about tripled in size. So um, while we're still a startup, we're a pretty big startup. And along the way, we've developed some really interesting techniques for using data to help us build product. Um, and that is exactly what I'll be talking about today. So I have four parts for this talk. The first, I'm just going to briefly describe what Etsy is. Um, the next, I'm going to talk about how we deploy code, um, how we launch new changes to the site. In the third, I'll talk about how we use data to inform that process. And then in the fourth section, I'll just leave you with some takeaways. So first, Etsy, in brief. So Etsy is the world's handmade and vintage marketplace. We are an e-commerce platform where craftspeople, vintage curators, and um, creative entrepreneurs from around the world can list items for sale. This is a screenshot of our homepage, and you can see a few different types of items featured. So there's everything from food to art to jewelry to um, plates and cups. We have over 26 million items from 1 million shops in 150 countries. Um, I have some examples um, of the type of listings available for sale. Um, these are actually all from sellers in Seoul. So this is a, a seller who makes leather goods. Um, you can see here a handmade leathers, a leather man's bag. Um, here's a seller who takes traditional fabric and turns it into modern um, home decor. And here's a seller who makes little felted mice. Um, I think this one is a couple to put on top of a wedding cake. So there's lots of different types of goods available, and the idea is that these are all unique individual uh, items that you really couldn't find any place else. And so we have a huge community of 40 million members that come to Etsy to um, buy goods directly from other people. What, made, what makes Etsy unique as a technology company is that we don't make any of these goods. We don't design them, we don't distribute them. Our entire value is as a technology platform for both the buyers and the sellers, which makes it a really fa fantastic place to work in terms of our software process and data-driven development. Just to give you a few more numbers to get a sense of our scale. Um, so we're a big site, we did over a billion uh, in sales from the marketplace last year. And that means we're generating tons of data. So around 150 gigabytes of web logs daily are being collected. We also push code continuously. So um, every single day, we are making changes to our website, our apps. Um, we have, I think, over five apps now. And we're doing that continuously. So um, something like, um, some, some days as many as 40, 50, 60 changes are happening every single day. We call this continuous delivery. Etsy did not invent continuous delivery, but we are one of the largest um, e-commerce sites that use this method of software development, um, and, and certainly we're an innovator in the field. We also run lots of experiments continuously, and this is where um, I'm going to talk about this in the third part of my talk, is about how we leverage that continuous delivery platform to run lots of A-B tests collect data, and use that to inform what, we're, what changes we're making for our users. This is a screenshot of my inbox from February. This is a week worth of emails I have about changes. Um, and this is just a few of them. But it gives you a sense of how frequently we're making changes. And it doesn't really matter what's on here, but the point is that we're launching things to some percentage of users, to 100% of them to some subset of our employees all the time. We're making changes, improving the site, making it better for our buyers, making it better for our sellers every single day. Great, so moving on to the second section of my talk, I'm gonna talk about continuous delivery and how we deploy code. At its core, continuous delivery boils down to this button. This is a button that you can press 
to deploy changes live to the site. The basic principles that allow us to use that button for single button deployment uh, are a few. We have a single source repository, so all the code is on one repo. We automate a lot of steps of the process. So we automate the build, we automate the testing, we automate the deployment, and that leaves us in a position where we're always ready to deploy quality software at any time. And we do, many times a day. This is an example of what one of those changes could be. So on every uh, employee's first day, the, all of our technical employees, so engineers, designers, product managers, they make a change to the site and they push it live. So this is an example of a change to our about page. The about page is the, the page on the website that shows faces for everyone who works at the company. And so what we do is when you have your first day, we'll say, okay, great, you have to go update the about page to show your face. So in this example, um, Ashley has the green line indicates a new line of code. She's added her image. And the red line indicates that she's removed someone else's. And so she's changed, made two changes to this file, and she's ready to push that out. So just to give you a small example of, the, of what I'm talking about when I talk about very agile, fast development, and creating culture around it where everyone feels like they can be part of it. So why do we do this? Well, we believe that it allows us to move faster, which allows us to fail faster. And that's important because the sooner we can fail, the sooner we can know what we're doing wrong. We can find bugs in the code. We can find problems with our hypotheses. And we can therefore get to success faster as well. It's more empowering to people. So it's really exciting to come to some place where you can make changes happen so easily um, and feel very safe about doing so. And it breeds a lot of confidence in the deployment process. So instead of deployments being something scary, they're something that are routine. They happen every day. And this is, a, this is also a reason that we can attract really great talent. So from the perspective of having a really amazing engineering and product team, people want to work at Etsy because they have this empowering, confident, um, agile way of developing. So I'm going to now show you an example of what this looks like in terms of an actual product change. So this is the cart page of the website. So if, if you've added something to your cart, maybe in a previous visit, so a week prior, someone came and they added this set of vintage rubber stamps to their cart, and they came back today. Because Etsy is a place full of unique items, many of which are vintage, and there is only one available, if that item sells, then they might not be able to buy it when they came back. So this is what the cart page looks like if you add it to your cart previously and then it's no longer available. And it's a pretty terrible experience. There aren't very many options for what to do. You can see that it's, it gives you this red, um, this is, I don't think this button works. Um, this item is currently unavailable and it gives you some options to remove it or to contact the shop owner, but there's no way to continue shopping, your shopping experience. And so the product manager has a very simple idea. They just want to add a link next to that message saying, see similar items. And we already have a part of the site that populates similar items. Our data science team has created a beautiful page that creates um, a feed of, of items that are similar to one that you might like. And so all we want to do is just add a link and to redirect people there. What, how would we do that? Well, say this person has the idea at 10 in the morning. They might go and they make two changes to their code. So the bottom in the template is where it's, we're actually adding the link to the page. So you can see it says, see similar items link, and then there's a link below it that is the actual URL it goes to. And above it, it says, if feature is enabled. What that means is that it's going to refer back to a config file, which is the top code snippet. And in that config file, we're telling the template whether or not this is on or off. So you see that there's an enabled line, and right now it's enabled to off. So part of our continuous delivery method is to have all of our feature changes behind config flags so we can turn on them on or off very easily. And I'm going to come back to this later, but um, the basic concepts are, are right there. So he's, the person has gone, the product manager had the idea, they went and made their code changes. Again, they're, all they're doing is adding a little, little link to the site. 
The next thing they would do is they would go through our deployment process. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but it's a really, it's a really amazing um, kind of simple but efficient way of deploying code that's been built by our <coughs> development operations team, our DevOps team. Um, and part of the process is getting into an IRC channel and getting into a queue to decide who's next to push. That's what this is showing. One of the next steps is to go to what's called the Deployinator, which is an internal tool that Etsy has built. It's open sourced now that basically manages the deployment queue. And you can see a few things called out here in, in bigger um, blown up. One is this top one is showing the last deployment and it's showing who made the deployment, what time the deployment was, and the diff actually links to the diff in the codes, the differences between the old and the new code. Um, and there's, you push to a staging environment first, which is called Princess, and then you, unfortunately, I've, I've hidden the button behind this blown up thing, but then you would push to production. And after you push, the person who makes this change, in this case it could be a product manager, this is not really a technical change, it's just adding a URL, would go and watch operational metrics to make sure nothing broke. And so part of the process of continuous delivery is the idea that we, the engineer doesn't hand their work off to some other QA engineer to, to push out their code. The individual who writes the code is responsible for carrying it over the finish line, so to speak, and getting that out live to everyone. And so here you see each of these vertical lines represents a deployment. This is about an hour time frame. And so there are about, I think, five or six deploys in that last hour, and you can see a bunch of um, important metrics and whether or not they're being affected. So just to come back to why we do this again, um, ThoughtWorks is a consultancy that specializes in continuous delivery and they have some really great um, writing about it on their website. This is a quote from them, I think speaks to it well. Because you're integrating so frequently, there's significantly less backtracking to discover where things went wrong so you can spend more time building features. And this is the number one thing I want to emphasize about continuous delivery. It means that you can really spend more time thinking about what you're building and how you're building it and getting it out. John Oswa, um, an SVP at, uh, in engineering at Etsy, and a writer on this topic, has described it this way. So if you have a um, kind of the idea of change over time, what we're doing when we're making product changes is we're trying to get to some better endpoint, right? So we have this concept of moving things over time. In a traditional software development process, where you're pushing code every two weeks or every two months, you wait a long time, you put a lot of lines of code into that change. With continuous delivery, what you're doing is you're breaking that down and you have small amounts of code change deployed frequently. So your change, your access, your slope is the same. You're making the same amount of code changes overall. Maybe it's still 50,000 lines of code in a month. But instead of deploying those in two chunks, you can just deploy them in 30. And therefore, you can detect where bugs are better and you can move more quickly to figure out what, whether what you're deploying is quality or not. So, so that's kind of very briefly how we think about continuous delivery at Etsy and why we believe it's an important process. I'm now gonna talk, switch topics and talk about data for a little bit and I'm gonna try to bring these back together. I hope you'll see that the way we think about using data very much mirrors how we think about deploying software. So first, this is a picture of our data stack. Um, we have two key parts, sets of data that we use at Etsy. The first is the transactional data that we're collecting in our production databases. The second is clickstream data that we're collecting via beacons on our website, apps, and in emails we send. Um, ultimately, both sets of data end up in a combination of a Hadoop cluster and a Vertica warehouse that can be accessed by people around the company with varying levels of skill. When I talk about data, I'm really talking about this data that we're collecting internally about what our users are doing. And ultimately, well, the point of the data we're using is to understand how people are using the features, how they're using the website, and think about whether or not they're hitting, having problems, whether there are opportunities to make their experience better. There are lots of different methods we can use to work with data. So these are just some of them. Um, everything from A-B testing to uh, cohort analysis to understanding a feature, predicting the impact, um, to smaller data like ethnographic interviews and surveys that are done by user research groups. 
Um, I don't have time to talk about all these different methods today, so I'm just going to focus on A-B testing. So I'm going to walk you through the steps we take with A-B testing. I just walked you through the steps we took with continuous delivery and do the same for A-B testing. So the first thing we do with A-B testing is we come up with a hypothesis. So uh, here you can see, this is a screenshot of our, an old version of our listing page. The listing page is where you have information about the item that you may want to purchase. So it's one of the most important pages on the site. And there are some things we didn't like about it that you can see that are highlighted in yellow. Um, one is that the picture of the person was very small. And Etsy is a, it's really about connecting buyer to seller. We wanted to make sure that people, the person's image was more prominent. People were also sometimes confused by what it was, and, and they were clicking on that when they were really trying to shop. And you can see above it, we had this, we had a couple of small images of other items, and people were interacting with that a lot. And we, so we had this theory that people really wanted to look at more pictures of other listings available. We also had very confusing links to various ways to share that content, and we wanted to organize those better. So we came up with a design. That, did some, that addressed some of those issues. So in the right, you can see the new version, what we're gonna call the treatment. On the top, there are images of more items. There's a more prominent picture of the seller. Um, we've re reorganized the information about how to buy the item. We've also reorganized the sharing information. So our hypothesis here is that this, image, that this version on the, on the right is going to lead to more engagement. So people are going to click on more other listings. They're going to be more likely to buy something. They're going to be less likely to bounce or like leave immediately when they land on this page. So we have our control, we have our treatment, we have a hypothesis around it. Next thing we're going to do is launch that. <laughs> and you'll see that this looks very similar to the config flag I showed you earlier. There's one difference. Um, and that difference is that the enabled is to a numerical value instead of on or off. What that means is that, <coughs> apologies, what that means is that 10% of the visitors to Etsy, a random 10%, will see the new version versus the old version. The third thing we'll do here is wait. So we We've come up with our hypothesis, we've come up with our new design, we push it out to a percentage of the population. Here we're gonna, we're gonna wait to see, collect enough data to make sure that we can actually run a statistical test to know whether or not the change we're seeing meets 95% confidence interval. <coughs> so, for those of you who aren't familiar with sample size calculation, this website is a really great one for helping you do it. Basically, you can input how much traffic you, you, you're going to have, and it will tell you how many days you need to wait to get enough data to power your statistical test. So we wait. The fourth step is to analyze. Um, this is an example of an in-house tool that we built at Etsy that allows that automates a lot of the analysis associated with A-B testing. It pulls the data that we need, it visualizes it, and then it runs the appropriate t-test to see whether or not the difference between the observed for the variant and the observed for the control is statistically different. <coughs> so you can see here that actually on the right, the items that are in blue and bold, it means that it, it meets that threshold. The p-value is um, that it, it's statistically significant. And so this suggests that actually a lot of these changes were statistically significant. So that's great. And here's also where we'll spend time actually understanding is this having the effect we want? Let's go back to that hypothesis. We thought it was going to change bounce rate. We thought it was going to change conversion rate. Did it do those things? And that will help us make a decision. Because ultimately, right, that's what we want to do. We want to make changes that will have a positive impact. So ultimately, we turn this on or we turn this off. So I, kind of, I gave you an example that was very black or white, sort of like old and new, and we tested it and then made a decision. And it kind of makes it sound like it's like this. Designing, you develop, and then you measure it. Now, the problem with that sort of method is that it means that you're putting all your design work before you actually have any measurement or understanding of how people are using the site. And so at Etsy, we try to make it look more like this. Really short, iterative bursts where we can very quickly validate whether the, what we're changing is having the impact we expect or not, and allow that feedback from our users to influence how we're, how we're designing 
and thinking about the changes that we're making to the apps and website. So I'm going to go back to that example I showed you and try to complicate it a little bit <clears throat> by showing you what actually happened the very first time we made a change. The old listing page, and you can see that there are only a few actions that someone, someone lands on this page for the first time. They don't want to buy this item. They don't want to press the add to cart. What else can they do? They can hit the home button, or they can click on those two images to the right. But otherwise, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of opportunity to interact with the site beyond either purchasing or leaving. And so we wanted to try to make it easier for people to, have, to see more items, to surface more things that they might like. So we thought, what's the easiest thing we can do? Let's just add more items to the top. So there's no change to anything below that sash. It says no change to the core listing page. We just added another module on top to test this hypothesis that people want to look at more listings. And the results of that experiment, we saw a really big impact. So a 10% reduction in bounces, an increase in listing pages viewed, and a conversion win. So it's great. So when we launched the full redesign in August, the one that I showed you before is the variant, <coughs> you can see that it had a version of that sash at the top. But you can see there were a lot of other changes too that weren't in that first experiment. And so that's when I say iterative bursts of testing individual changes, that's what I mean. You didn't come up with some whole new concept and spend nine months working on it and then test it. We tested little iterations along the way. Here are examples of some of the, I think we had over 25 different versions that we tested. And you can see they all have different treatments. We're trying to learn about how users are responding to the, new, the changes in order to make sure that what we're working on is moving things in the direction we want. And it's making things better for buyers, making things better for sellers. So the idea of continuous iteration, and here I've used A-B testing as an example, is that you have an idea and it's not that very blocky method of idea and then build it and then maybe see if it worked but it's idea and then test and then think and iterate an idea and, and test it and iterate quickly. And all along the way, we're using data. And that data can be A-B testing data that I just talked about. It can be types of data I haven't talked about. It can be user research data, which is a really powerful way of knowing whether or not what you're doing is meeting the expectations and motivations of people. Data is really great for telling you what's happening, but sometimes you also need to ask people to understand what's not yet happening, but what they want to happen. So all throughout, over and over again, we're using all those inputs to help inform how we're building. So going back to this idea of continuous deployment that I talked about earlier, we had this idea of change over time and talking about small code changes deployed frequently. When I'm talking about layering data on there, I'm talking about the same exact philosophy. We're breaking down big changes into little ones so we can be um, sure that what we're doing is moving things in the right direction. I like to think of data adding a third axis to that chart, which is the direction of the change, right? <coughs> so we're pivoting how we're building things to make sure that they are meeting our users' needs. To go back to the idea of a calendar, <laughs> Say you're working on an eight-month project, and it's a really big overhaul. In a traditional model, you might think, we're going to start work on February 1st, and we're going to try to launch that change September 1st. We're going to spend all that time building and designing and getting it exactly right. Well, at Etsy, we like to try to make it look more like this, where each of those circles represents a launch, and it represents an opportunity to learn and get data back and get feedback back from our users about how that launch in September is going to look. So that we're not surprised September 1st if we launch it and no one uses it. Or we launch it and it turns out we're fundamentally misunderstanding the use case or the problem or the, um, the seller or buyer needs. So going back to this idea of using data every day to make decisions and looking at that kind of that inbox I showed you, and the, the point I'm trying to make about continuous delivery and continuous experimentation is that the, it really helps inform every one of those launches. And it's one of the ways that we can be confident that what we're doing is making the site better. So, 
I've talked about continuous delivery and I've talked about data. I'm now just going to leave you with a few takeaways and try to sum up exactly what I'm, the point I'm making. So the first one is to validate early and often, and that data helps validate ideas. So again, this gets back to the idea that if you're going to put resources into ch making change, and those resources are people's time and energy, you want to make sure that you're using those resources to the best possible use. And that means validating that what they're doing is the right change, and data helps do that. Now, this is something I haven't said explicitly so far, but I think it's kind of been subtly throughout the both parts of the talk is that I kept showing you screenshots of tools that Etsy has built, both in terms of our deployinator and in terms of our A-B testing framework. And the reason I showed you those is because those, those are really important to the fact that we freed up people's time to spend more time thinking about the users and thinking about the product because they have workflows and tools in place to automate a lot of the um, more mundane aspects. The next take takeaway is to leverage existing workflows. And what I mean by that is that when you, when, when I, I mentioned earlier that over the last few years, we've built up a lot of data culture at Etsy. And the way we did that was we made that our, our A-B testing framework look very similar to our continuous deployment framework. We reuse that config flag. We reuse the idea of watching graphs to make it as seamless to engineers and product managers as possible. And then the last one I'm going to leave you with is, is kind of to refute something that I hear a lot, and that's it's that experimentation is just for optimization. And I, don't, I kind of reject that idea. I think experimentation can be incredibly helpful in making big changes. Just because you're breaking a big change into smaller steps doesn't mean you're not getting as far. It just means that you're being more confident in the steps you're taking, and you're being more agile in your approach to potential pitfalls. So um, I would certainly encourage everyone to think about using data and experimentation in big and small changes. My last takeaway will be to point you to some other talks on these topics that are really great and go into more detail, <coughs> especially around continuous delivery. And with that, I think that's all I have for right now. Thank you. from Samsung Engineer, Samsung Electronics. Uh, I'm a software engineer, and what I can see from your presentation is that you always keep changing the interface of your web page. Yes. And I wonder, wouldn't it be that frustrating <laughs> and sometimes confusing for the end user? And how do you deal with that aspect of the your yeah. work. Thank you. That's a really great question. Um, and it's, it's, not, um, it's not an easy one to answer because it's, it really is a matter of uh, finding the right balance between making those rapid changes and respecting users' workflows. So I would say that one thing is that the changes that we're talking about making are usually released to a very small subset of people. And they're usually relatively minor. And so for most people, and I'm specifically talking about people who buy on the website, I mean, think about your favorite online website where you might buy from. You, maybe you visit it once a day, but a lot of times, especially when you're talking about buying behavior, you're visiting less frequently. And you might not necessarily notice if we've moved you know, a module slightly or we've kind of added bigger images, it honestly might not even cross your radar because you're, you're, not, you're not making those before and after comparisons that we were just making. Um, so that one thing I would say is I think in large part people don't notice. It's a little bit different for sellers because sellers on the platform 
are using it every single day and they have very specific workflows around parts of their experience. And so there we run very, we run a lot fewer experiments and we try to communicate much more clearly to our users when we're making a change. Um, so it's a great question and I think that there's a, there's a line to walk. I would say, again, in general, we're not overhauling all these features every single day. We're making small changes and over time those will help us make those bigger changes. But, um, you know, it, it's not as if it's a new site every time you come. 네, 추가 질문. 네, 네 그, 어, 네, 많은 도구들을 소개를 해 주셨는데요. 그것들을 갖추어 나가는 과정에서 어떤 어려움들이 있었고, 어떤 툴들을 뭐 도의 하나 어떤 순서 뭐 이런 것들이 있었는지 그런 것들이 궁금하거든요. 그거에 대해서 설명 부탁드립니다. Um, that's another great question. So certainly um, we have to prioritize development of internal tools, especially because it can take away from the development of uh, tools for our users. Um, I would say we've done, it's mostly it's been an organic process in the sense that a lot of the things that we're building are for engineers, and engineers love to build things that make their lives better. And so we're seeing people find problems in their workflow and want to work around them by building something. Another thing I hear asked a lot is why we don't use more third-party tools. And so, for example, for A-B testing, there are third-party tools out there that you can use to automate the analysis. Um, and that, a lot has to do with the fact that Etsy has a very strong engineering culture and we want to build things in-house uh, because we want to make them very specific to our use cases and we want to be able to own the data ETL from start all the way to finish. Um, but it's an ongoing process and so, you know, we go, through, we go through planning cycles where we have to decide what we're going to be spending our time and our resources on and we do have to think about how much do we want to invest in improving that A-B testing framework that we have internally um, and weigh that against other options. Um, so it, I think it's, it's, there's prioritization involved as there is with any project. Um, we've been lucky enough to be you know, a high growth company where we're not so resource constrained that we have to make incredibly tough choices around that. But. Thanks for your talk. Um, so my question is, um, you talked a bit about this fast-fail iterative process to release. And I was wondering, how do you decide uh, how to make those iterations? Because um, I imagine that has a big impact on your data sets as well. Mm -hmm. um, because the size of the change uh, and the, uh, the how observable it is the end users will probably have an impact on how reliable the end data is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that gets back into the, the slide I had that talked about how you, um, I realized you didn't talk about it in depth, but sample size calculation. So the inputs that go into deciding how long you need to run an experiment for are how big you anticipate the change to be in your key metric, um, how, and how many people are seeing it, and then the confidence level interval you want. So for example, if we're trying to change something like uh, our bounce rate, you know we maybe we'll expect a 5% change in that, and that's not, it's not much. And the way we can get to that faster is either increase the number of people who see that, right, or run it for longer. And so that's another place where we kind of sometimes have to make a decision between do we want people, you know, we don't want to run things for a month, so we maybe we want to run things at most two weeks, and how many people, like what's the lowest, I guess this is what I'm trying to say, we always try to look for the lowest number of people we can show it to to get data we need in a timely manner. Where timely to us means usually a couple weeks or less. Um, so, you know, I think your question raises another point, which I think is a good about also 
Running experiments or being iterative is not an excuse to be lazy or careless about how you're thinking about your changes. Um, because to the first, first um, questioner's point, you have to, you, you're going to be disrupting people. And so you, have, you want to be very, very conscious that you're making smart decisions about how you're iterating. Um, and that you're using your time and your bandwidth wisely. And I mean, I've made it seem like we have this ability to make all these changes, which we do, but at the end of the day, we also only have 52 weeks in the year. And when, we, when you start breaking those 52 weeks down into a you know, couple weeks of experimental blocks with time for iter iteration in between, it's actually, you start running out of weeks very quickly. And so you still need to be strategic about how you plan out that calendar and how you think about testing different elements. Um, and that's where really great teams come into play, having a great um, product manager, technical lead, and designer, and analyst and researcher who combined can really think through those questions and be strategic. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm a UX designer at Escape Planet. I'm just wondering, how do you cope with UX designers? Because I mean, asking because designers wants to solve one big problem yeah. rather than consecutive many small problems. Yep, it's a it's another great question, um, and I wish that the designer who worked on the listing page redesign was here to talk about it because she would do um, a much better job than I would at answering this question. She's actually the one who designed my little like iterative timeline um, for me. She, and I think one thing she would say is that she sees the type of data she gets back from analytics as an aid to her design. Um, so because she can still visualize the endpoint of this is, this is where we want to take it, and sometimes that's where we start is to say we want to go in this direction, and then it's a matter of thinking about how do we validate those changes in smaller steps than that end goal. And it might be that at the end of that process, it looks exactly what, like what was envisioned originally, or it might be that along the way that we've informed that and shaped it and made it look a little bit different, but it still holds true to that original vision mostly. Or it might be that we actually went in a completely different direction and all those things are possible, but um, I, tr I try not to think of it as an ad antagonistic relationship between designer and data, but I recognize that sometimes there's more tension than others, depending especially on the culture of the company. I like to think at Etsy, designers are very um, excited to use all the data we have, um, and especially because they're, they're key components of our product development teams. They're right there in the rooms making decisions. They're looking at the experiment results as well um, and using that to think about how they're designing. Um, so it's a good question. I think it depends a little bit on the culture of the company. Um, I hope that they can work together. <laughs> <laughs>